Good morning. In my last uh, conference, I discussed the importance of so-called bridging institutions, which uh, are capable of, uh, of putting together the world of science with the world of policy or the world of decision-taking by the things I described by making by being sure that stakeholders are involved from the very beginning, meaning they are, the process is going to be legitimate, that the best science is going to be included, meaning that the, uh, there's going to be uh, credibility to the results, that uh, it uh, the, the 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 exercise is relevant by by allowing stakeholders to place their priorities um, together with others, negotiate about priorities, and finally by uh, translating and communicating and following over a long period of time the entire process. This uh, role, compli complicated role, is best performed by institutions. I'm going to give you an, an example of an institution of that kind. This is an institution that was created in Mexico. Its name in English translated is the National Commission for the Knowledge and Use of Biodiversity. Use is an important word here. And it was created by, it was designed by academics, by scientists um, that work for the National University of Mexico, that still work for the National University of Mexico. Their idea was that an inventory of the biodiversity of the country was needed. There were no um, centralized lists of any kind of species. The government would know uh, where to look if they needed to to do some um, some um, take decisions about um, about uh, create environmental impact assessments, for instance. They normally resorted to private firms that did consultory on this on this issue and often they were very poorly performed con consultories and so on. So in 1992 the Mexican government decided to create a federal um, agency for basically performing the inventory of the national biodiversity. In 1992 it was created. The anecdote is that for a year there was no budget. Uh, to be precise, 0.9% of the requested budget was allocated, but uh, and 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 therefore, to 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 paraphrase uh, uh, a British lord once addressing their fellow peers in the in the in the, in the House of Lords, since we don't have any money, we will have to think. So we spent a year thinking on how to to do this this uh, this task that was uh, uh, charged to a number of people, small number of people actually at the beginning. There were just five people. Uh, the budget was enough to pay for five persons. So um, the commission was created, and the first task was to do the inventory. We spent several years just inventorying, and by that I mean. Uh, essentially um, compiling lists of species from from different catalogs and from different books and then locating museums both in Mexico museums and herbaria both in Mexico and abroad that contain the specimens because the 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 example of of Australia has shown that you can do a lot of interesting statistics with with the specimens um, at that time niche modeling was not, I mean, it was something that the Australians did. There were pioneer uh, examples in other countries, among others in my own country, in Mexico, in 1971, we had a professor doing what essentially is uh, niche modeling. But uh, there was no clarity about what for. It was a mandate, the government wanted it, I was appointed to, to, to direct this inventory, so we started doing it. <coughs> After about four or five years, uh, interesting things began to happen because uh, one of the first things we did was not only compile the inventories, we were following a little bit the Australian model. And in Australia, they had niche modeling. And, uh, and it was clearly very useful for them. They had tons of examples of interesting things you could do with, with niche modeling. So they start. we started trying to imitate that. And... Uh, the the result was that 
very soon we had big databases of specimens, large amounts of um, climatic layers that we had to commission because Mexico at that time didn't have any. Um, and uh, the third thing was some familiarity with some algorithms to do niche modeling. This combination started, it, it took several years to, 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 to be assembled. We were extremely lucky that several things happened. The Conavi was created under the, basically by presidential instructions. The budget came basically by, because of presidential instructions. And the, the dean of the national university, which in Mexico is a very big deal, was also extremely in favor of Conavio. In fact, he was one of the architects, the conceiver of Conavio. So anytime there was a problem um, of whatever kind, administrative, budgetary, uh, no facilities, whatever, we, can, we could call him and he would fix the problem. In whatever problem it was, if it was uh, high enough, he would go even if directly to the president of Mexico and things would get fixed. So for four or five years, we were able just to work without being asked much questions about what are you doing with this money, the taxpayers' money, uh, how uh, are you meeting uh, meeting dates, are you are you meeting uh, targets, what are your indicators of performance, what are your indicators of 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 uh, of uh, success? None of these things. We were just the first really many months just thinking what we were going to do, and then started doing it. I had to change the venue of this recording because my dog was barking. Probably you didn't notice, but I was noticing. So the light may be different and the background is different. And the only thing that remains is uh, me, the, 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 the conferencist. Um, the last thing I mentioned was that uh, the first years of its existence, Conabio basically spent the money and the time and the effort of the people working there uh, in getting uh, data and organizing it in databases. It was a, a very big deal at that time. I'm talking about 1990s. Uh, the, the, the data models were not stable. Uh, there were ample room to commit mistakes, and we committed practically every one of the possible mistakes, logically conceivable mistakes. We, we committed the, the, the error. But at the end of that time, we had databases of specimens, we had um, environmental uh, layers, and we had um, the capacity to do some um, niche modeling using algorithms borrowed from the Australians. <coughs> and then, more or less at that time, fortunately, or perhaps it was not fortunately, we were capable of helping others, other uh, institutional uh, in, other other agencies in the federal government, in the Department of the Environment, in the Department of Health, in the Department of Agriculture. So Conavio started the, moving all this knowledge that we had, which it was not Conavio's. It was the um, it came entirely from the universities, the research centers, the museums, the herbaria in Mexico, which. It's it's sizable. Mexico has um, um, very sizable capacity in in terms of systematics and and taxonomy, mostly of plants and vertebrates, but some invertebrates as well. So we started applying these things to uh, problems that ke kept coming from the Ministry of the Environment, specifically things that were they were doing were. They were interested in what places could be used to create new reserves. The, the system of protected areas of Mexico was growing very fast at that time. Um, there was more money. There were people really, really active trying to make it um, more, more, well, stronger and more, more professional and all that. So they wanted to know whereabouts of good places to do conservation that beyond just the mere uh, beautiful landscapes or um, well-preserved ecosystems. They want to know where the, the, the localities of really important areas for biodiversity. That's what, that was one. 
another one uh, they started asking questions about restoration uh, ecology and they, they, it, this, this was a forestry agency they wanted to know what kinds of species to use in what kinds of places they started asking questions uh, in, the, in the Ministry of Agriculture about invasive species and they started asking questions about vectors of diseases for instance expansion of dengue uh, all these questions are very practical and they had very specific stakeholders it was people from the different ministries asking very specific questions and Conavio began having the capacity to answer many of this uh, because we had databases and we had models or modeling capacities if we didn't have the databases for instance we didn't have databases of mosquitoes at the very beginning so um, we had budget so we could spend money in capturing the data in the in the medical collections been there for I don't know probably 30 40 50 years but they were not captured so we could capture the, the data we could um, captured data from friendly institutions outside Mexico, uh, for instance, the Smithsonian. Several times we paid the Smithsonian the, the amount of money they were asking for the effort of hiring people to capture the labels in important specific uh, um, um, databases that we wanted. So, uh, essentially, the institution began without really knowing what we were doing we began putting in contact the all the the the, the scientific knowledge in terms the scientific knowledge which was in the form the shape of names taxonomies systematics and biogeography distributions of species on the landscape with uh, a set of users and this process took several years to to develop properly because at the beginning we were using scientific names and talking about uh, provincial uh, um, biogeographic provinces and things like that and the stakeholders were not necessarily interested or um, well it was not relevant for them this relevance thing was very important and the other thing that we started appreciating without having read the papers was that unless we had um, uh, stakeholders together sitting with us together uh, since the beginning the results we were very nicely producing out of supercomputers and huge databases were not being uh, used and this is the next I'm going to give you a, a real-life example of this the best example that I have um, of how Conavio transferred um, knowledge or, or science to policy is uh, the, the the handling the management of the problem of the transgenic organisms organisms uh, genetically modified organisms this is something that has been happening in the country in Mexico for the last uh, at least 15 years, probably 20. Uh, and it began with um, transgenic uh, cotton and transgenic soy and several um, fruits that were also transgenic, but also but it really exploded with uh, when uh, when uh, there were there were very strong um, efforts by by private companies to to produce uh, transgenic corn corn is uh, a different thing in mexico <clears throat> corn is uh, a, a, a cultural value um, mexicans we are made of corn corn was invented in mexico developed in mexico uh, many thousands of years ago and we eat corn all the time in in so many varieties that uh, unless you you have lived there you cannot uh, imagine so <clears throat> when transgenic corn Bacillus thuringiensis corn became available uh, it was uh, a, a big a big um, a big issue and one of the first cases of transgenic uh, movement of transgenic genes from uh, commercial varieties to to folk races was reported and documented in Mexico. So this was a, a very very 
uh, loaded politically and socially situation, and it ended in, in being handled by by Conavio. <coughs> um, we and why? Because we were in, uh, we had the capacity to do the risk assessments uh, that the government. Uh, being pressured by NGOs, mostly large NGOs, started requesting from the companies. Uh, so the first thing that Conavio had to do was to to define what was to be protected, what was the 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 the, the, the social good that was to be protected. This is um, lawyer talk, uh, because at that time we were beginning to realize that unless we had lawyers together. Um, it would be difficult to to make things that were also socially and, and nationally institutionally relevant. <clears throat> so what was what Conavi was trying to protect, or rather what the federal government would like to protect in the case of, of transgenics. And there were two things. One on in one extreme was the need to do research and advance agriculture, agriculture and and, 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 and put Mexico in the current with the best uh, um, um, technologies and on the other hand we didn't want uh, uh, to have problems of human health or environmental health or simply uh, there were species that people the people the public the the, the 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 mexicans did not want to uh, include transgenic sequences why because 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 they didn't want to, and that's a very valid reason. 